Welcome to the How Soccer Explains Leadership Podcast, where we explore leadership principles through the lens of the beautiful game. Welcome back to How Soccer Explains Leadership. Thanks again for being a part of the conversation. I am Phil Dark, your host, and with me, as usual, is my brother, my co-host, Paul Jobson. How you doing, man? I'm doing well, Phil. I'm excited to get into our guest today. It's a, a blast from the past, from my days at, at Baylor. But uh, before we do that, man, things things here at Waco are going uh, going well. Just plugging along, winding down the the end of the semester with the boys, finalizing sports and school, and you know all that comes with the end of school, which is basically nothing but them having fun and parents having yeah. to run around everywhere. But things are good, man. How about uh, things in the dark house? You're probably bringing some kids home here pretty soon. We have the entire dark family in the house again, and I think we may have been talking about it earlier off air about how it's a whole lot different when you have the family of seven when they're little than when they are uh, 13 to 22 because they're a lot bigger and they have more stuff. And let's just say the space issues are a little different issue. But, you know, it's it's OK. It's OK. We don't you know, the, the, the four boys you have, I imagine your food bill will be different, you know, than our food bill when your boys are, are the ages of mine. It's it's still pretty darn high. I'm not going to lie. But we have very healthy eaters in our house. So they're that sometimes mean they're not eating as much. So that's good. But anyway, you know, you're, you got some growing boys. So I'm sure it's already it's already tacking up. I'm thinking about selling one of them to pay for the food for the others. That's kind of where we're <laughs> almost where we're at. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't do that, but maybe that was, that, was that was a joke. That was a joke, everybody. Everybody, yeah. that's yeah. not no, serious. Don't. Do not call defects. Yeah. Everybody's safe here. Um, yes. But yeah, so, but yeah, we're all good. It's going to be, uh, I can't, I, I wish you got to get a the little hidden camera for your summer in that backyard with the pool and the craziness of the of the Jobson house this summer. I, I look forward to hearing more about that. We definitely have a lot of fun, and um, I'm sure that we'll be posting some photos of the the craziness of the summer here before before we get no doubt. before too long. So no doubt. All right, but we have a little bit more stuff to talk about today than just our summer fun, which I, I'm sure you folks would want to just keep listening to for hours on end. But we are going to uh, get to our to get our guest, as you said, blast from the past. Paul, as we learned just off air, that Lance Van, Van Heitzma, he is the CONCACAF's referee, refereeing technical and development manager. And uh, I hope I got that title right. It's a mouthful, but it's uh, I'm for sure we're going to get into what that means, what that looks like, and, and a whole lot more in this conversation. But we also learned that Lance's beginnings in the refereeing in the Big 12 uh, had a familiar face on the sideline in his first game. So... Anyway, we uh, we have this uh, this conversation. Very look forward, very much looking forward to getting into it. So, Lance, how you doing? Thanks, Phil. Thanks for allowing me on the show. And Paul, it's great to see you. As we said, a blast in the past. And Phil, as you were alluding to, my first game in the Big Twelve in my career. Uh, this would have been probably er like. 2012, maybe 2013. Even Paul was on the sideline. Paul, you weren't the head coach yet, though. You know, no, there was earned, another, earned there was a more prominent yet. head coach there, yeah. Hey, Marcy. Yeah. So it was great so though. Like, you know, the assistant coach is usually the, what do we say? The, the, we don't say the designated yeller anymore. We say the, <laughs> the tactician. So that's it was great. We had to, that's why we had to switch our roles. Cause I was, I was way too vocal to be an assistant coach. So that was really down to the heart of what it was, is that I had to, Marcy had to move along just cause she wasn't vocal enough. Um, to be a head coach. So, but no, I'm glad after that first match, you decided to to continue officiating uh, because over the years, you were definitely one of the familiar faces I enjoyed seeing on the, when I would walk out to the field or see the assignments. So uh, I know we'll get into to more, more details as we dive into the, the show, but Lance, I'm, I'm pumped you're here, man. It was great to, to re really reconnect. And of all the people that we interview, we interview a lot of coaches and uh, different people within the game. It was about time we got uh, a referee on here, somebody that really understands the game, sees it from a totally different space, and I'm really excited to to jump into it. But Lance, before we really get going, I'd love for you to just share with our audience a little bit more about you, how you uh, grew up in the game, uh, how you how you found your passion for the game, and kind of where it's led you to today. So I'm originally from Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan area. 
you know, growing up, it was more about uh, being with your friends than it was winning or being in a competitive team. So, you know, uh, back in the 90s, I would say, I don't want to date myself here, but back in the early 90s, where it was more AYSO was very big. So uh, many of us uh, in the Grand Rapids area got our start playing in our local AYSO teams for our with our friends. And typically it would be one of the friends' dads would be the coach, right? It was very informal, not like how it is now. And then I kind of progressed through the ranks through, with friends to do travel teams, traveling all over the Midwest playing, uh, playing a little bit in college at shout out to College of Worcester in, in Worcester, Ohio. And then transferring back up to Western Michigan uh, and finishing my career there. I did not play at Western Michigan. I uh, focused more on my studies as a chemistry major. But that's where I got into refereeing because I love the game so much. And it was such a big part of my life in high school, in club soccer, the, the friends I made, uh, the friends I still stay in contact with from, from way back when that I needed to be involved. I needed to do something. And probably like many people who that start off refereeing, they referee for the money. And being in college, needing a part-time job, I thought, what better place to do to have this part-time job than refereeing? I had plenty of referees growing up that I thought to myself, if they can do it, I can definitely do it. <laughs> this can't be that hard. But then <laughs> once, you, once you stepped onto the field, and the ball comes out of touch near you, out of play, and you're the assistant referee, and now you have to make a decision which way is the throw-in supposed to go. That was probably the hardest decision of my career. It was my first decision. Because I remember pointing one way and the home crowd booing. And then so I said, oops, it must be the other way. And then they cheered. So I said, oh, I must have got it right. And then at halftime, the center referee, who was more experienced, says, hey, go with your gut. Go with, go with your instincts. Don't get influenced by outside factors. And that's something I've always remembered to this day, which was uh, 2001. So here we are 23 years later, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. And, you know, these are some of the, the life lessons that I've learned through refereeing in my career, whether it had been at the high school level whether it be at the, the youth, U.S. youth soccer level, the collegiate level, uh, some of the professional level game, and now at the, at the international level in which I'm uh, one of the managers at CONCACAF 4. So uh, I look forward to our conversations uh, further about uh, leadership and refereeing. And I feel it's a natural fit. You know, referees, we're, we have to be leaders out there on the field. You know, we're, not only are we leading 22 players on the pitch, but we also have the coaching staff. We also have the substitutes. We have our own team of referees that we, we have to lead out there. And then we have all the spectators as well that we're seen as the leader. So, you know, for me, I've always felt like I was a, a, a natural leader, but I really didn't understand what leadership meant until I became a referee. And then which I transitioned later into being a school teacher and having a lot of the same similarities of, of managing people, leading teams, leading uh, to success and different things like that. So I look forward to getting into the details and also uh, answering some hard questions, which I know will come about <laughs> refereeing. And hopefully well, by the yeah. end of this, we'll have two new referees registered to be able to give back to the game. Well, well, Lance, one thing that most people don't know about me, and I think probably still as well, is I've, I've actually done some officiating, which is probably why I was harder on referees is because I felt like I, you know, as a coach, I knew it all, which is, that's what all coaches think, right? But uh, I too, in college, well, I'd refereed as a, in high school, but in college, I'd, I refereed as well uh, for the money. I need a little bit extra money. We ran the two-man system. I was in South Carolina and ran a two-man system uh, for these high school teams. And man, that was just, Brutal, brutal. So anytime I come across a two-man system somewhere, I just I feel for those those guys and girls that are having to do that. A lot of responsibility. But I am excited to talk about the the leadership portion of this because, like you said, man, it's 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 a leadership role that uh, I think a lot of people don't think about it that way. I think a lot of people see it as a as a servant role, which it is probably both. It's a both and, right? You're there to to serve and to 
to uh, to make sure the game's going in, in, in the proper way to keep things regulated in a way, but to lead. And I think that's one thing that I thought you always did really well as a referee is you led well from the field. If you had a, a coach who happened to get out of hand, which I'm sure never happened, but if one did, you just had a great demeanor about you. It wasn't about you as the referee, but it was about the match. And hey, you know, you every once in a while I'd have to come over and talk to Marcy, of course, and say, hey, you know, maybe calm down a little bit. But no, I, I want to definitely get into those leadership roles that come into to uh, into officiating, but before we dive into that, can you tell tell us exactly what it is that that you're doing with Concacaf now? What does your role really entail now with Concacaf? So I've been at Concacaf since 2019. Uh, I retired from international futsal referee panel at that time. I was on the panel since 2016. I had a great time being on the futsal panel, representing the United States. You know, having went, having been selected and participated in the 2016 FIFA Futsal World Cup in Colombia, um, and then later on in the Youth Olympics in Argentina in 2018, as well as other uh, CONCACAF competitions. And then came, a, came an opportunity that I just could not pass up, um, and that was to work at CONCACAF as their, at that time, their manager of refereeing. I tell people it's an easy decision to make, even though we had the World Cup coming up in 2020 and I was looking forward to participating in my second World Cup. Uh, but, you know, con working at CONCACAF has always been my dream. And some people, it's funny when you tell people that, oh, really, that's your dream to work at CONCACAF? I said, absolutely. Anybody that works in football, you always want to work and try to achieve at the highest level, whether that's refereeing, coaching, playing, or being an administrator. And back in, was it 2011, I was a liaison for the Gold Cup, a referee liaison for the Gold Cup. So I got to be in the locker room with the referees. I got to uh, work with the referees in stadium, got to be in stadium to watch them uh, officiate down, in, uh, down at FIU Stadium in Miami. So, and then that later... Uh, allowed me other opportunities where I was then a liaison and uh, support at local seminars that CONCACAF and FIFA would host together for referee. And I always saw people, uh, the referees, these were the top referees in the world that were at World Cups. I said to myself, man, like, like I would love to be where they're at. But at the same time, you have to be realistic about your goals and your aspirations and your limitations. So when one door closes, another one opens. So then I always thought, well, I want to be an administrator at the highest level. Uh, and then having this opportunity that opportunity knocks, it was the perfect timing for me because when I look back on it, 2020, we had this small thing called the pandemic that put the world on hold, which put everything that FIFA did on hold for another year. And you just never know what your future is going to hold. And to be able to take this opportunity with CONCACAF, uh, to be able to expand my leadership roles and responsibilities, to be able to help referees now reach their goals and achieve their milestone moments in their lives. With the technical and development side of things, I am the point person and project leader for our development initiatives. And our, this could be our, our referee academy, which we're looking at uh, talented referees that are not yet FIFA in our confederation, and, but have the potential that are maybe one to two years away from becoming a FIFA referee, and where we bring them to a cons an introduction course, which is a two-week uh, course. This past year, we held it in Mexico with uh, the Mexican Federation, and where they're able to to do classrooms training. They're able to do on-field training with our FIFA instructors. They're able to train at Mexico's Federation, which is one of the top, fa top facilities in the world. They're able to officiate youth matches there in Mexico. So they're getting this experience that they would never be able to have back in their home country or region. And we're introducing them to what we want and what the expectations are to be in a, fit a referee in CONCACAF and to hopefully start their journey start their journey, a long journey for them, but a journey in which we're there to support them. Then we also have other uh, development initiatives. We have our talent mentor program, which this year we did at Dallas Cup. Uh, we usually have a Dallas Cup Referee Academy. So we do some development initiatives to focus on raising the level 
of officiating within our confederation, as well as our member associations. Uh, and then we later with the with the technical side where, you know, I am the point person uh, responsible for the uh, appointments for for the matches, also with our referee department and our uh, referees committee. So it's a it's a big job. There's yeah. some long nights that are sleepless when there's matches going on or when there's referees traveling or, you know, to some of our smaller uh, areas of the of the Confederation. But like I said, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love it. I tell people it's not work if you love what you do, uh, which we're very fortunate to work in this industry and, and get paid. We get paid to do what we <laughs> love. And it's amazing. Yeah, I, lo- I love that. Some amazing, like just so much involved there. So many different things that you're you're doing and responsible for. And uh I love the idea of, you know, there's a lot of coaching in there, right? You're, you're, you're leading people and uh, instructing in, in what I consider a, a part of our industry that's uh, very much needed. So uh, I, I commend you for that. And I love your, I love your passion. Uh, also, we'll, we'll dive more into maybe the nitty gritty of some of those things as we move forward. But before we do that, one thing we love to do with all of our guests, it helps us really kind of navigate where, where we go from here. But tell us, what is, what is your personal why, Lance? Like, why do you, I, mean, I can tell your passion. I can tell your passion about the game and about officiating. But what is your personal why? Why do you do what you do? For me, it's about helping others. You know, I look back at uh, when, whether I was a pl- a player, whether I was a student, whether I was a referee. There was always somebody in your life that had this impact for you. And it, it, these individuals come at different part, enter your life at different parts of your life. And, you know, I look back and I'll speak specifically about refereeing, but I look back in my refereeing career. And if you would have saw me when I first started refereeing high school soccer, you would have been like, this guy, this guy's wearing basketball shorts. This guy's got solid black socks. He's wearing uh, a Casio like dress watch. Like I was a hot mess, right? Just a hot mess. I had long hair. You know, it was just a mess. But there was, I had a couple mentors back home in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, that saw something. They saw something different. And they saw that you can't teach uh, professionalism. Now, I've learned that professionalism is much different than I thought it was back then, you know, but I thought professionalism was just uh, showing up on time and being reliable, but it's also looking the part, you know, being professional on and off the field. And if there's anything that I take to heart is that it's helping people. You know, I was a school teacher here in Palm Beach County. I moved from Michigan down to Florida back in 2006. Uh, I was a school teacher for eight years in Palm Beach County School District. I like to say I retired from teaching, uh, but I really focused more on my passion, which was refereeing. So this is why I was doing the, I was on the college circuit. I was doing a lot of games in college. I, I got to meet a lot of incredible people, a lot of incredible coaches, Paul, like yourself and your wife and others in the Big 12, SEC, ACC conference uh, that over time you have, you forge this relationship with because you have a common interest, a common goal, and that's to help people be better. And, you know, something we talk about at CONCACAF is we're always looking for good people first, good people first. If you're a good person, you can, we can help you become a good referee. But if you're not a good person, it's so difficult to be able to, to help you because you need to help yourself first. And we're very, very lucky and fortunate at CONCACAF to, to have an incredible group of referees that, that are more than just referees. And it's about helping tell their story of who they are and the 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 man and woman behind the whistle as we like to say and there there's because a lot of the times we have this perspective that oh they're they're uh they're calling the game one way or or you know they don't like me or things like that and there's so much more to a referee than any of that uh any of those excuses right it's about the leadership on the field. It's about the dedication and commitment off the field. Um, it's, it's wild. And we tell our referees all the time, all the time, 
we say be better today than you were yesterday and be better tomorrow than you are today. And those inches that you grow each day, when you look back four, six, eight months down the road, a year down the road, those inches become feet, yards, miles, as opposed to always looking back and saying, what if? So we're always here to help. I love helping people. I've always loved helping people. And I feel like I'm in the, I'm in the best position to be able to uh, help people ach achieve their goals and dreams. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we get the chance to help more people today as you're, uh, as we're doing this, uh, this conversation and getting it out to people who might not otherwise listen to somebody, you know, a referee, you know, they're, they're, they're usually like yelling at referees. So now they're able to listen to a referee. And I, and I will say like Paul, uh, except I currently am, am still refing as does my daughter who's, who's uh, 15. She's rocking it. Like they, they asked her last time we were out to have her go and start you know, going up the ladder of refereeing because she's, she's doing so well. So I'm excited for her because she's dialed in. She's, she's very she's by the book, you know, looks, she's that professionalism you were talking, she looks the part, right? And then my 13 year old, actually, as we speak next week from Saturday, will be getting trained and certified to be a referee. So they they all play as well. And I told them it's not only important to, they can make money. Yes, but you also learn the game better and you, you see the game differently. And I think it helps your game as a player to be able to referee, not just because you understand refs more, but because you see, you see the, the game from a different angle, literally and figuratively. So anyway, that's, that's just another uh, little plug for out there, folks, to you know, get, your, get your kids out there or yourself out there refereeing. I think every coach should have to at least have to referee um, to, to see what it, what it is like and feels like and sounds like. And I think every eight-year-old parent, a uh, parent of an eight-year-old, uh, should be required to referee to hear what it sounds like in the cauldron of an eight-year-old soccer game on the field. <laughs> Those are all side notes. Um, I'm sure you can appreciate what I'm talking there. Uh, you hear it from every side. I can't imagine being an eight-year-old kid nowadays trying to play a game with everyone screaming from every angle. But that's uh, that's a whole different conversation for a different day. What I would like to get to you now is just, you know, you you, you talked about briefly at the beginning about life lessons and and different life and leadership lessons you've learned as a, as a futsal and as a soccer, you know, referee, but what are some of those lessons? Let's just kind of just talk about, you know, a few of those lessons that you've learned over the years and, and really how, how people can use them in, in life outside of the game and other areas of life. The biggest part is perspective, understanding perspective and not losing that perspective. And each match has its own perspective. And I think this is what helped set me apart from others is knowing that although it's a game for referees, many referees outside of professional level are doing this because it's a hobby or maybe they're doing this because they, they love the game or they could use some extra money. Whereas professional level, you're doing it as your, as your profession. You have to understand that the, there's a lot of coaches at, at the youth level, at the, especially at the collegiate level that are doing this because this is their career. This is their career. And, you know, you have to understand that perspective in order to understand the emotions of these coaches and individuals and in players in the game. You know, youth soccer, as I mentioned before, is a lot different than when I was growing up. It's a lot different than all of us. And it will be different uh, 10 years from now. And to have this perspective that it's it's it is a game, but to some on 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 that on that day, it's more than just a game. So you have to be able to carry yourself in a way that you are professional, that you understand the magnitude and you understand the perspective and what's at stake in this game. You know, and it's talking about doing your research, doing your homework you know, approaching each match with a clean slate. However, you are prepared to deal with situations when they occur. Because if you don't prepare, you're preparing to fail. We like to always discuss and talk about the journey, the, pers the perspective of the journey, that you have to enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey of officiating. Enjoy the journey of life. Because it's not just the end goal that's important, but it's the people along the way that you either have an impact on 
or that later on have an impact in your lives. You know, as we as we said before too, the you know when a referee's out, out there, people people just think that they're out there blowing a whistle that they just rolled out of the park, you know, out of their car thirty minutes before the game, and they're they're showing up to the the field. But there's so much more that goes into that. You know, fitness training, video quizzes, video tests, laws of the game tests. There's unless you've been a referee like you guys have, people don't understand the commitment level that is needed to be a referee. Even a youth referee, you know, the recertification they have to go through. It's not it's not easy. It's it's really not easy. And unless you are able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, you really don't understand what they're going through. And for for the referees, I feel it's it's always a thankless job and it's always going to be. However, it is very rewarding when it's done correctly. You know, the best compliment I ever received, ever received. And it, Paul, it wasn't from you. Actually, Damn. it wasn't from you this time. It was a losing team coach coming up to me and saying, I lost today, but that was the best officiating I've had all year. Mm. Because that really puts it into perspective. That tells me that that person, even though wins and losses are so are are important in our game, they have a place in our game, I should say. Wins and losses do. It's not important at the youth level because that's more development. But you know, it's it's incredible to be able to receive a compliment like that because to me that is a that is a non biased compliment. It's non biased. We don't have. It's not because you won. It's not because you got to call a certain way. It's because this coach at that time or this parent at that time, it's even better when it comes from a parent and they lose because then you know it's real, genuine, and sincere because of how difficult uh, parents can be. And, and trust me, my mom and dad, actually, my mom was, I wouldn't say she was difficult because if she's listening or watching, like I don't want her to <laughs> you know, get a phone call later from her. But uh, I was, when I would watch my brother, like I was terrible growing up watching him so you have to really have this perspective and and enjoy the journey enjoy the journey along the way and i'm sure you guys can relate to this and paul you can with coaching you know your coaching career because at the same time as as a referee you never know when it could be your last game you never know you know when i retired from the fifa panel i never got a farewell game i never got a last game because it just abruptly ended because a new chapter of my life started so you know we're I use, you know, individuals that are retiring from the FIFA panel or retiring from coaches that know that this is their last game. It's special. It's special for you when you get that feeling, but it doesn't always happen. Uh, I was lucky to have something similar to that when I refereed the 2019 uh, Women's College Cup final. I had done the 2015 final uh, with uh, Duke versus Penn State, and I was still kind of a young pup. I was working really hard. I was established on the circuit and it was like, uh, I was really surprised. I was kind of surprised I'm getting this opportunity, not because I don't, I didn't deserve it. It's just because I didn't think I had climbed the mountain yet. Um, so when I'm in this game, the game went by so fast for me, so fast for me. Like next thing you know, I blinked and it was, we had 10 minutes left in the second half and, and you know, Penn State was winning and they ended up winning the national championship that year. Fast forward to 2019, and I realized that I, even though it was only four years, I realized I was in a different part in my career, and I was getting to a point where I thought that I was going to be scaling it back. And I knew if I scaled it back, I wouldn't be having the same exposure uh, to the game as I normally would if I was on the circuit, you know, refereeing in, in all the major conferences that were, that were not the Pac-12 at that time. So in that game, when it was Florida State, North Carolina, that game was so special for me because during warmups, I knew this, was, this could be my last uh, postseason match. I knew it could be. I wasn't sure, but I knew it could be. And it turns out it was my last one. It was my last one. Actually, it was 2018. Sorry, I got a year difference. It was my last one where I knew that from here, I was going to be hanging it up in postseason soccer. So that game felt so special to me. There was so much emotion behind it that 
I knew I had to leave it all on the on the field. And it was it was incredible. It was incredible. But we don't always get that. So we yeah. have to treat every game we do like it's going to be our last game because we never know what could happen later on. No, for that's, sure. For sure. No, that's that's uh, absolutely the case. And, um, you know, I, I, I that idea of perspective, you know, I, I often talk about refing with a, a different aspect of that perspective and angle, you know, in the context of, you know, people are arguing about everything, it seems like nowadays. And we don't take the step back to say, hey, what's your perspective on on life? What's your worldview? Where are you coming from in your position, whatever it may be? Right. And in refing, you're blocked from plays. You have a different angle on the tackle or on the handball or on the whatever than the coach, than the other players. And so that idea of you don't, you don't know what you're seeing unless you're you, right? So you, you have no idea what the ref is actually seeing. Now we're going to get into VAR in a few minutes. So that's going to be a whole conversation in itself. But I think that idea of know where someone's coming from. And so even as you're in the middle of a game to be able to see the ref miss a call in your opinion, could be they just saw a completely different thing from their angle. And that happens in life as well, right? Um, another thing I wanted to just mention on that, it's similar, but a little different, is this idea of, you know, this is not a, a thing when you're, especially when you're in the middle of a game and it's moving fast. And as you get up to that higher level, it's moving faster and faster and faster, right? You have this idea of, you have the law, you have the, the rules of the game, and then you have the reality of the subjectivity of you, as well as some of the calls are subjective as well on whether it's actually, you know, for different referees. Can you just kind of speak to that? Because that goes into life as well, right? There's these rules, but then there's the application of the rule or the law. Can you kind of just speak to that for a little bit? Yeah, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. You know, if we, if we uh, enforced the laws of the game as they're written, it would it would be very, it'd be a very difficult game because, you know, just look at like throw-ins, you know, you're supposed to throw the ball in from where it leaves the field of play one yard from each side. How often do we enforce that? You know, how often do we enforce uh, a correct throw-in at, you know, a younger level? Um, because it's important to get the ball in play, right? Like we try to not make it about us as, as it was mentioned before. It's not about us. It's about them, them, the players. And this is where it falls in that gray area. You know, we talk about the black and white, the letter of the law, and the letter of the law is very important because that's the framework. That's the framework and, and that provides the consistency of officiating. But it's the gray area that sets apart good referees from great referees because the spirit is where you have a little bit of that wiggle room, okay? So for example, maybe uh, you have a challenge, it's a foul, it might be a yellow card, it might not be a yellow card, you know, it kind of falls, it has some considerations for yellow, some considerations not for yellow. So it, now it becomes about feel. What's the feel for the game? Does the game need it? Does the player need it? And is it required by the law of the game, the laws? So having that feel is what separates top level referees. And this is why when you're watching international games and you're seeing fouls and you're like, man, that looks like a yellow card. That looks like a red card. But then they come out with different, um, different decisions. It's because they have such a high level feel for the game. Now, it needs to be supported by the laws of the game. 100 percent we don't want people going out there and making up their own rules as they go because it creates bigger issues but it's about having that feel having that we, we call it football understanding at the top level and the only way you get football understanding is is being in the sport for as long as as long as you are whether it's a coach whether it's a player whether it's a referee uh, these are ways that you can improve your football understanding. You can just be watching more games. You know, we have a lot of referees that uh, are part of, uh, they live in countries that don't have a lot of football or don't have a lot of top level football. So we encourage them to watch as much football as possible. Watching, I mean, I turn on my TV, my Fubo TV on Sunday, and I'm watching games in Honduras. I'm watching games in El Salvador. I mean, there's games, oh, Saudi Arabia. 
there's games all over the world to to be that are going on and being televised. So there's really no excuse anymore about not having a resource. And the game is the best resource. You know, referee in the game, the game is the best teacher. We say that with players. We say that with referees and coaches. The game is the best teacher. Uh, if you're able to learn, have more mistakes happen. To, we always say you would rather have the mistakes happen to your friend who's refereeing and you learn from them than, than happen to you in the game. But mistakes are part of the game. And how you learn from those mistakes, how you grow from those mistakes, how you're able to manage that technical versus the spirit is what separates. No, absolutely. One last thing real quick. I want to just hear your thoughts on this idea. We, we, we've all watched a game and you see a referee miss what seems to be a clear foul or whatever the case may be. And then five minutes later, they seem seemingly have a makeup call on another, you know, not so obvious foul that they blow uh, in favor of the team they seemingly missed, right? Um, what are your thoughts on on that idea? Um, you know, as far as this idea of don't don't compound a mistake with a makeup call later in the game, so to speak. I mean, you you've seen it. Yeah. We've all seen it. Now, whether it's intentional, unintentional, what does that look like in a subconscious? How are we teaching against that? What is what is that? What do you what are you what are you doing from the other side of it as far as training up people? But in you know, it's human nature. It's we're all human. So the last thing we want to do on the field is make a mistake or feel like you've made a, a perceived mistake. And like you mentioned before too, Phil, there's nothing worse than compounding a mistake with another mistake. So you have to, I've always learned, you have to have a reset button. And I think a reset button is actually good in life too. When you're, when you're, uh, when you feel that things are not going your way, when you feel that, you know, ah, maybe I made a mistake or maybe I need a reset. Um, so when I was a referee, my reset button was I had, I wore a sweatband and every time I thought I made a mistake, I made a perceived mistake in a match. I would wipe my forehead and I would say to myself, reset. And that was my reset button. That's when I knew that I had to let it go. And I had to move on to the next decision because whether it's futsal, whether it's football, soccer, the game can, the game can catch up real quick, where if you hold on to that mistake, you're going to make another mistake for sure. Whether it's a missed decision or you're making a decision that's not correct. And you always have that sense of uh, that human side of you where you're saying to yourself, man, I made that mistake for that team. But you have to understand that everything will even out in the long run. Everything evens out. So you should not think of it as one team or another. You just need to make the decision that's in front of you. And that's where you, to me, that's where you gain the reputation, the reputation of a, of a, a top referee. And, you know, I've always thought, that a good coach will recognize that. He'll recognize when he, he or she knows something's not supposed to go in their favor and does go in their favor, they should recognize that maybe that referee is not somebody that's really on top of it today. And because you want that consistency across the board. And that's something we, we teach at referees at all levels. You know, we want you to be consistent handball which everybody loves handball i mean i can't tell you how many handball clips we see out of the the epl like each weekend right uh var how it's implemented what's the the line of intervention uh offside you know interpretations of uh deliberate play versus uh deflection you know we just we want consistent interpretations and consistent applications cuz it's for the players it makes less stress on the coaches and it helps the spectator, the general spectator, have a, a better understanding of what's going on. Because as we say in youth soccer or professional level, you know, the, the pressure that the fans and the parents put on the referees is, is a challenge at times, uh, especially at the youth level with, with, with parents. It used to be when I refereed back in the day, that it was the coaches that put the pressure on you, but now it's the parents that put the pressure on you. So 
Paul, I know you're a parent. You're not a coach anymore. So now you're putting pressure on referees from the other, other touchline. Uh, but Lance, you know, I am way, I am way better uh, parent to an official than I was a coach to an official to put to the point where I've had parents say, how, how could you and Morrissey stand down there and just be so calm? And, and to your point about perspective, you know, I would say, Hey, my livelihood's not on the line here. <laughs> my kid loses this game. We're going to go, we're still going to go have pizza after, you know, it's not, may not be my last game because I'm going to, you know, perspective is, is important. And I, I actually had to jump on and officiate a game for my kid because nobody showed up. So coach like, Hey, you know, soccer, Paul, why don't you jump on and referee? And I had a lady yell at me the first two minutes. I went to the sideline. I said, I said, ma'am, I'm just volunteering my time. I would love to give you the whistle if you'd love to come do it yourself. And she started laughing. She goes, no, nah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I think that I love, I love, like, I want people to go back, Lance, to rewind the last like three minutes of, of kind of what you just said there. There's some amazing uh, lessons in there, um, all the way back to perspective and then onto the, the things that you were just saying. And a shout out to our friends at Soccer Resilience, your, your whole thing about reset. Yep. I know they teach that a lot through Soccer Resilience with their athletes that they, that they work with about reset. And it's such an important thing that I think all of us, whether you're a coach or uh, cause coaches, we need our reset buttons too. uh, coaches, players, officials, you know, it's, it's an important thing because in that moment, right. When you've perceived that you've made a, a mistake, your perspective is changing. If you can't reset as an official on the field or a coach in the moment or a player in the moment, now all of a sudden your perspective is different and you're feeling like, okay, did I, and you're thinking about the wrong things. You're magnifying a mistake instead of focusing on what's going to be the next thing. So I don't make another mistake. And as you talked about com compounding mistakes one after another. So I just encourage our listeners go back in those last couple of minutes. Cause what Lance said there was extremely valuable. And I think any application of, of, of the game or just leadership in general. Yeah. And, and two, you mentioned soccer resilience, go back to the Brad Miller episode, the first one and get yeah. the neuroscience mm -hmm. behind the reset. And what Brad talks about that too, because that is a actual practical real life example of that reset and so anyway totally yeah totally agree with that well and i have to say I, I, just because in, in full transparency last when you said that about wiping your brow i maybe want to go back and watch film and of our totally games, see how many times you wiped your brow in, in our games 100 my favorite 100 percent. my favorite was and now that i'm retired from the field i can give a little <laughs> bit of my inside my 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 yes, secret inside let's go my inside scoop here is you know I used to always, at first, I used to always wear a wristband because I was taught that never put the whistle to your mouth unless you're going to blow the blow blow it. Okay, so whether it's a foul, whether it's a decision, whatever the case is, because if you put your whistle up and then all of a sudden you don't call it, and then a team goes on a breakaway and scores, you're opening yourself up to criticism because now the coaches, the parents, the players are saying, "Hey, ref, you put the whistle to your mouth. Why didn't you blow it?" And then you have, now you're on the defense. Now you have to explain why. And nobody wants to hear the why. <laughs> nobody wants to hear the why, <laughs> right? And so I always thought to myself, okay, so this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I was taught by a, an old referee in South Florida. It's like, you wear a wristband. He's like, if you go to put the whistle to your mouth too quick, because it happens to everybody, and then an advantage happens, you use that wristband to wipe your forehead. <laughs> And that way, if a coach says something to you, which I have had coaches, hey, you put the whistle in your mouth. I said, no, I didn't. I was wiping my forehead, the sweat <laughs> out of my eyes, you know, that type of thing where it's like the little tricks that, you know, work, work for you, you know, yeah. and you have to be able to have these little tricks in your bag <laughs> because as referees, there's only one referee out there with a whistle, two with the flags, one is the fourth, you know, we're lucky to get VAR, which we'll segue into, but you have to be clever. You have to be clever because if you knowing the laws of the game is just that's the expectation. That's the standard. But then it's how you interpret those laws of the game, how you're able to be clever, how you're able to have good personality. We teach personality and management, you know, where, where you're going to be. Uh, are you an educator out there at the youth level? You need to be an educator because nobody, <laughs> not many people know the laws of the game. So you have to be able to help educate. Uh, are you a police officer out there? Adult games, you pretty much had to be a police officer because they're not going to listen to you unless you're stern. And then you got to be at the international level and the professional level. You're the conductor. You're the conductor. You're, you're only getting involved when you need to 
when things are not going the way they're supposed to go. Because if you watch, like, even at the Division I men's level, in the Division I women's level, there's not a lot of fouls that occur. But the fouls that do occur are impactful on the game versus the Division II and Division Three level, where it seems like they're out there to kill each other for 90 <laughs> minutes. And you're, you could have 60 fouls in the game if you choose to. So it's about uh, now I have to pick and choose and my feel for the game and what the game needs. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's much like in, in life, you know, when you're um, whatever you do in your profession, you have to you're just there's going to be different leadership styles that you're going to have to learn in order to be successful. And the best leadership is empowering others, empower others, help others get there. It's not about you being first. It's about helping somebody else get first. Yeah. I love that, Lance. I love that perspective. And I, I value that. I appreciate you, you sharing that. It's awesome. I do want to segue. I do want to transition to our VAR conversation because we mentioned it earlier in the show and everybody's probably waiting to talk about VAR. Uh, it seems to be the hot, the hot topic uh, these days. And I, I, I'm not sure, honestly, Lance, what I, what I think of it. I know as I was starting to, to exit the game, there started to be more technology that was being used and goal line technology and some of the different conferences were making that mandatory, just the use of technology in our sport. I know there's positives and negatives. I'd love to hear from your perspective as we, as we really talk about VAR. What are, what are your, your thoughts on VAR? Is it better or worse for the referees? I mean, we see it as, as fans and as coaches, what that might look like. I don't know that many people are taking on the perspective of 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 what uh, what it what it means for the officials themselves who are having to to use it and manage that, and uh, just take us through kind of your thoughts on that. What do you think about it? And you know, yeah, just love to let you go from there. I'm not going to put in any more bullets. Let you go. This is the world we live in, you know, the world of technology we live in, and and technology is going to continue to advance. You know, at the previous at the last World Cup, we had uh, semi-automatic offside technology. So you've got, it's no longer, you know, drawing a line, making a decision at the top FIFA level. They're actually using body pinpoints on the body where they're able to determine whether it's onside or offside. Like, you know, we're talking millimeters offside, but this is our reality now. And VAR has been around since I believe 2014, somewhere around there. It's been close to 10 years, I think, since the pilot project began. Uh, in college, I think it was around even before that, where in college was using more video review and in certain situations that could happen and when when it can be used. But um, it all starts with referees getting it right on the field. And that's what we teach at the at CONCACAF level. Get it right on the field. You know, we want you to waste the money for VAR. We want no VAR to be used in our game. And you tell us that you you spent you know, X amount of dollars for us to have VAR and we didn't have to use it. And that's a good problem to have. VAR should only be used in those situations that no matter what the referee could have done, they were not going to get it right. So it's so it doesn't cheat the game. We, everything goes back to the Thierry Henry handball uh, in, in the World Cup qualifier match. And that opened up that evolved the game in terms of technology to a level that nobody would have ever thought about and get it right on the field first but most importantly we have to have education and the education isn't just with the match officials uh the referee assistant referees VARs but it's also with the spectators and i think this is where we have a lot of confusion and uh, misunderstanding when it comes to VAR in different leagues around the world that you always see, oh, there's a mistake in, in, in X country or uh, this was a travesty in Y country. And when you, when you s look back at that as a referee perspective, you realize, well, that wasn't a mistake. It's just that it wasn't maybe communicated the best or maybe the education that goes along with it isn't isn't the best with it uh, or it's not impactful enough. You know, this year at CONCACAF, we've done, we've improved our infotainment. So when you're in stadium at matches, whether it's Gold Cup, Women's Gold Cup, Champions Cup, anything that has VAR that we're using, the spectators are seeing on the monitor what is being reviewed 
and why is there a stop? Why is there a delay in the in in restarting play, and what is being reviewed? So at least there's no guess. Like, oh well, why? That was a goal. Why are they? Why is it? Why is it taking a minute and a half, and they haven't kicked off yet? Well, now you're seeing it on the screen. They're checking possible offside. So this way, you're kind of there's still a, a sense of um, uh, I would say like what are they saying to each other in terms of that. But uh, I think you're going to see down the road that there's going to be maybe opportunities for 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 transparency uh, to to happen. And when we get to that point, we're going to have uh, I, I think that's when we're going to be more we're going to be better off using technology and VAR. Look at rugby, right? The referee is mic'd in rugby and he's talking. You can hear the referee talking to the about the decisions about the to the players, and that has a level of transparency that makes people understand the game better. So I think down the road, you may see more transparency when it comes to VAR because there's really, there's nothing to hide. There is zero to hide with VAR. It's just a matter of also, you know, there are conversations that players have with one another or players have with a referee that may not be appropriate to, <laughs> to, to hear for the public <laughs> uh, in terms of for kids and families. You know, but there's going to be a point where we're going to get to that, where it's going to be uh, people are going to have a better understanding of VAR and the process. But it starts with getting it right on the field. You got to get it right on the field. We don't want referees having to use VAR as a crutch. And, you know, we have two countries, well, three countries in our confederation of 41 countries that use VAR, Mexico. USA and Canada and the MLS, MLS venues. So 95% of our referees are not using VAR back home in their local games. And I feel that is a, that is a, a big reason of why our referees at the international level, men and women, have been s- tremendously successful at the World Cups because they're not using it as a crutch. They're going out there to referee because they're refereeing back home every week that they're refereeing and they know they have to get it right. They have to get it right. And they're all, and the ones that do have VAR in their countries, they are being taught that you only use VAR when it's absolutely necessary because of uh, a mistake, not as a way to bail you out. Yeah. Because I, I think we've all been in games where it seems like the referee isn't calling a penalty kick because he or she knows it actually has VAR, right? It seems like that anyway, right? They're like, they, they, are, they literally bring their whistle to the mouth, don't call it, but then it's got to be clear and obvious air. So it's like, well, they're not overruling it, but it actually probably was a PK, right? Like those, those type things. And that's where I think, to your point, if you're saying, hey, let's get it right, and then it's there to, to, to you know, be an air. If it's an obvious error, then that's one thing. But if you think it's a PK, call a PK. Right. And uh, and that that I think would I, you just it doesn't seem like you see that as much. Well, you got to have the courage. Yeah, exactly. You got to have the courage to make the big call, even mm-hmm. if the big call is incorrect. Right. You know, we want yep. you to make the big call. We want you to have the courage because you can't. It's hard to teach courage. You can't teach it. You have to get it mm-hmm. by experience. And we want you to get it. Obviously, we want you to get it right. A hundred percent of the time, but we also know that there are mistakes that are going to be made. We're human, uh, perspective, uh, based on where you are. And, uh, we want you to not be afraid to, to, yeah. to take a decision. And that goes back to leadership, right? Being a, Absolutely. being a good leader is not being afraid to take a decision, even if it's an incorrect decision. Now, how you learn from that or your next, your next decision you take is going to really define who you are as a leader. Absolutely. And I was about to say, because, you know, what's the word, you know, the, the reality is you get it wrong and then life goes on. But unfortunately, now there is a lot of this referee abuse going on. Right. And so I know that at least in our area, and I assume it's a nationwide issue and I might even worldwide. be on the nation worldwide issue where you just the younger referees are quitting like very quickly. And so there's this massive referee shortage because of this referee abuse. Can you speak to the referee abuse? And it's not just from players and coaches, from the parents, as you said earlier, 
Why do you think it's increased so much over the past few decades? It's a worldwide problem, you know, you, and it's not just a youth soccer problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like we saw football leagues in Turkey where there was a tax on referees from owners, you know, hmm. uh, on, on referees in Turkey. Wow. So these, these acts, these heinous acts of abuse where if you were in your normal nine to five job and somebody came up in your cubicle and started to belittle you, berate you on maybe an incorrect way, maybe some misspellings in your, in the email you just sent, that would never be tolerated. It would never be tolerated. But for some reason in sports, it's become tolerable. It's been, you know, you see it at the professional, like NBA basketball, like, you know, they're always kicking out fans for, for going, crossing the line on saying things. And, you know, I, it's not an easy problem to fix, to solve, because if it was easy, it would be fixed already. But, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, there are a lot of referee campaigns out there. Uh, that are going on across the world uh, in Europe, as well as here in the United States, and as well as in Mexico, uh, where they're, they, you need to highlight who the, highlight and educate. It's about education. How do we educate the parents? How do we educate the coaches? As we were talking about earlier, to have the, so they have a better understanding of why something is called a certain way. And mistakes happen. Mistakes are part of our game. But when there's so much money involved in, you know, we, we'll just talk about youth soccer. There's so much money in youth soccer nowadays in terms of what parents are paying, in terms of what coaches are making, what, what DOCs are making, is that it's a business now. It's a business. And nobody wants any sort of disruption from their business because wins and losses now count at the youth level. And it becomes more challenging to the referee, especially when the referees are younger. They're, they're kids, you know, and like you, you guys were talking about, uh, you know, Phil, you're talking about, you know, your daughter is a referee, you know, like she's out there refereeing and some, and a parent yelling at her. It's like, wait a minute. Like, why are you yelling at someone's daughter? Like, what if that was your kid? When we talk about pers perspective, what if that was your kid? Somebody was yelling at them. How would you feel? So our passion gets to us too much and we have to be able to take a step back. We have to be able to, to understand and emphasize with other people. And it may start with, you know, youth clubs, youth clubs talk about, they invest a lot of money into uh, player development. They invest a lot of money into coaching development, but do they invest money into referee development? Because if we can make referees better on a, on a grassroots level, we're going to be able to have a better product out there. And which means the parents are going to be able to have a better understanding of what's going on out there. So I think we're, we're at a point, it's probably, there's probably going to be an inflection point at some point, if, as I say point like five times. Uh, <laughs> but there's, I would hate for it to get to a point where there's a catastrophe before something is done about it. It needs to be done. We shouldn't be waiting for something to happen in order to make action and make change. I'm very excited about um, Carrie Seitz at U.S. Soccer, uh, who is the new vice president of refereeing. Carrie Seitz has a lot of great, you know, she brings a, a, a tremendous amount of experience from the international referee level, but also from FIFA to into United, to, to the USA to have strategic initiatives and development initiatives and to help combat uh, referee abuse and how we can recruit more referees. Because at the end, of the, at the end of the day, the more referees countries have is the better pool of officials that we are going to have at the international level to choose from, which then helps FIFA because now FIFA has more referees and better referees to choose from, which helps the game. So every, you know, we say one hand doesn't clap. It takes two hands to clap here. So the work that U.S. soccer is going to be doing, the work that Daniel Radford at U.S. Youth Soccer is doing and U.S. Youth Soccer taking a more of an initiative on cutting down on abuse and referee, de referee recruitment, it's going to take time. We should not expect results right away. It's going to take time for sure to make it happen. But as long as there is a plan, as long as there's people willing to, uh, to help and make change, 
you're going to see a, a big difference probably in the next, I would say, two years. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I, I keep seeing, I think a lot of these, these things that are impacting youth soccer have ripple effects all over the place, right? So this play-to-play -play system, which often results in entitlement in the parents, especially, and they see this as their kid's path to whatever it is, whether it's college or stardom or whatever. And then they take it out on the refs off. And because you're taking, because you call the PK on my kid or against my kid's team, that's going to take their, away their chance of making, you know, making it to college and getting a scholarship. I mean, it's just, it's so absurd. And yet that's the reality we live in is the perspective is so out of whack. It, it has these, these, all these unintended consequences and this ripple effect out there. So I, I, I I'm very, I, I hope as you hope that we can continue to educate, we can continue to encourage, but you know, there, there's, there's things that we need to address, um, at the, at the lower levels of just, Hey, this, this is a game at the end of the day. And there's, there are lessons we can learn from it. It's a big part of what we're doing, trying to do here on the, on the, on the podcast. Yeah, Lance, I think, I think, uh, I think you hit it when you talk about education, you know, and I think you hit it when you talked about, you know, we talk about player development, we talk about coach development, but are we talking about referee development? And, and we're not, we're not talking about it. Um, I don't think there are enough initiatives right now to do that. My, my oldest son, uh, is 15. It's his first year refereeing. He really enjoys it. He understands the game. I encouraged him, hey, if you want to be a really good soccer player, I think you need to understand the game from every perspective. I think being an official gives you that perspective as we talk about. Um, and I said, and you've seen your your dad be an idiot on the sidelines. So I think you're, you probably can handle it. You know, we're all just kind of idiots over there. Um, but he does a great job. But what I will say is the folks who have done the initial training for him are people who are absolutely passionate about yeah. officiating. They're passionate about the game, but they're passionate like you are about officiating and, and developing young people. Um, so I'm excited to hear that there probably are some initiatives coming down the line to really recruit great referees because having been on the other side of it, having been at a high level and uh, in the college game, I kn you know the difference between your high level referees and your, and your not high level referees. The ones who are really passionate, I say that in the difference of those who are really passionate about it because they love the game and want to help people. And those are just out there because, well, they're, you know, it's my side job, you know, and I need to get a little bit extra cash. And again, it doesn't mean they're not, no, they're not good referees, but you can tell the passion uh, between those people. But I go, I say all that to go back to say on an education standpoint, I would love to see our, uh, our home base clubs, our recreation level facilities, taking more of an interest in developing our referees. And I think one way to do this is to say, hey, let's encourage our young people to officiate. You know, let's let you know, my, my kid just turned 15. He started, I guess he was 14 when he was doing it. But hey, why can't, why can't a 10, 11, 12 year old go out and run around with six year olds and, and manage, manage a game, you know, and, and, and grow that up to be part of our soccer community of, hey, I'm going to be a soccer player. I'm going to be a soccer uh, official. And I'm also going to be a coach. I think young people should coach younger people. And I think if we can build that soccer community where now fishing is just part of it, you know, like you said, we're, Player development, coach development. Why isn't there referee development? It's it's part of the game. It's a huge piece of the game. You know, you show up to a match, you know, and there's not a referee. You're irate. What What do you mean there's not a referee? Well, you know you have to have it. So why wouldn't you take care of something that's such an important piece of the match of the game? So anyway, that's a little bit of my soapbox. But I, I would love to hear more, you know, later at some point about some of the initiatives that are going about because I think it's so important. Because you're right, we're going to get to a point where we don't have enough referees. I told my son, I said, hey, the first weekend you show up, there'll be a million kids there refing. I said, you may not get very many games. Hang on till week two or three and you'll, you'll get every game that you can. And it was true. First week, there's like 50 kids out there refereeing. By week three, there's like 20, <laughs> you know? So uh, some of it's kids, some of it's, you know, parents not taking care of kids. But anyway, a little bit of a soapbox, but I'm on board with the, the, the culture, the soccer culture within our community it's got to embrace the official that we're going to be in a really bad place pretty soon. And it's starting. It's starting like, you know, I'm looking at Phil's shirt, United Soccer Coaches Convention, right? There's, there's a refereeing experience. There's referee education that's going, down, going on at the United Soccer Coaches. It started with Dr. Joe uh, back yeah. in the Kansas City Clinic, which was what? I don't know, 20, I, I don't remember, 2021, 2022, 2022 maybe. 
So it starts, it starts there. And now U.S. soccer has taken it over and done some leadership stuff there. The NCAA in the past has done things there. Uh, NISOA, National Intercollegiate Soccer Association, done some things there. So it's about the more we can get coaches and referees together to help with these initiatives and to help with the education and the message, it's going to be a stronger message, stronger message. And we're not saying every coach needs to be a referee. We're not, we're not, we're not saying that, right? We're not saying every player needs to be a referee, but it's going to make you a better coach. It's going to make you a better player if you know the laws of the game. What, what, what other, what other uh, profession can you have where you don't know the rules, you know, and you're out there, you're out, you're just out, you, you, you're out there driving a car and you never took a, a, a rules test, you know, or a driving test. So it's things like that, that we just need to provide more visibility, more exposure, more collaboration when it comes to uh, refereeing and, and, and delivering a stronger message. Because if Lance Van Heitzma is delivering the message about refereeing, sure, the refereeing community is going to tur turn in and they're going to listen and they're going to say, oh man, this is great. But then the, there's players community and coaches community that are going to say, who's Lance? Who's this guy? Why is this guy talking about perspective? You know, and that's, na that's natural. But with Phil and Paul, and this is your show and I'm the guest on your show and you have a, a different audience. Now we've got two audiences that are coming together to be stronger. So it's fantastic. It really is. And it's about, it's about working together. Yep. 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 A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Uh, Lance, we kind of, this has been amazing by the way, and I appreciate so much your perspective and, uh, just your passion for, for what you do. And, you know, as we start to, to wind down, we start to direct our questions to some questions that we kind of, uh, do with most, most folks on our podcast. Uh, that first question is, you know, what lesson, uh, have you learned directly from soccer that you use in re relationships outside of the game? Well, I can tell you with my wife, she doesn't want to hear me talk about refereeing because I <laughs> live refereeing 24 seven. But, you know, one thing we've always talked about is whether it's in college, whether it's in CONCACAF, it's family first. Family's always first. Family first and then allow football to come. And if football can integrate with family, Oh man, that's the best. That's the best. Paul, you know how that is being a coach and having the family and, you know, you guys, you know, you and your wife and the kids were, you know, you lived on the field down at Waco at Baylor, you know, and the road trips and the experiences, it's, it's amazing. And we have to be able to balance that too. And there are times where we have, we get caught up in the, the journey that we make sacrifices too much sacrifices so i always tell people is you're gonna have to make sacrifices to get to where you want to be 100 percent, because otherwise anybody could do it but don't make a sacrifice that's going to impact your family because your career could be over just like that tomorrow and but your family will always be there for you and you have to always be there for them so Family is always most important. Family should always come first. And we should never lose that perspective when it comes to family. Love that, Lance. Anybody who knows knows me knows I'm 100% in line with those, those thoughts. You know, uh, from a referee perspective, you know, when you're trying to choose between one or the other, anybody could, could officiate any match, but not anybody could be, you know, in your household, taking care of managing your household. You know, anybody could be the coach at Baylor University, but nobody else is going to be the dad of my children, you know? So 100% on board with what you're saying. Um, we, we say that, that. You know, I always close, you know, when we're at ceremony, uh, you know, we were in Dallas Cup, you know, mm -hmm. is uh, for our academy and it's Easter, you know, holiday weekend. Most of our, most of stuff, as you know, you guys know, as coaches, tournaments and events always, always occur over holidays. So yeah. you're always missing a holiday or, you, or you're missing, it takes a big part of your summer vacation when the kids are off school or you're having, you're missing birthdays. You know, you can't miss anniversaries, although my <laughs> wife is an, a saint when it comes to that stuff, but you got to make it up later on down the road or beforehand, right. but you, you have to be able to, um, to, to, to understand that there's more to life than just sports. Sports are great. 
I love sports. I love everything about sports. I love all sports. I'm a, I'm a sports junkie when it comes to history, knowledge, information. But you have to understand too that there are people at home that are that are holding up the house so you can go out there and live out your dream. And we always say to our referees that if you haven't called your fam, a loved one, a uh, a parent, uh, your brother, sister, call them, call them and thank them. So thank them. So because you're here living out your dream, they're doing the work. They're doing the real work because you're out, out living your dream. So it's so important to have that family and have that foundation. Foundation is such a critical part of success. Yep. You will not get any argument here on this podcast with that, uh, that message for sure. So definitely appreciate that. And though we could, we could have a whole podcast on that, but we're not going to, we're going to, we're <laughs> going to finish this one up. As we say on the show, the vast majority of good things must come to an end. And this is no exception to that. So this last question we have is what have you watched, read, or listened to that has impacted your thinking on how soccer explains life and leadership? Uh, I've been just like all the kids do. I try to, uh, stay with the, the current times of technology. So, you know, using my social media outlets, which I don't have social media. I don't have Facebook. I don't have Instagram. I'm probably, uh, one of the few people that are, that's off the grid on that part, but I do have LinkedIn. I do have TikTok to watch the videos and get lost in the rabbit hole on that. But, uh, you know, Tom Brady. Tom Brady, and I'm a big Michigan sports fan. I can say that now. I'm retired from college refereeing. A big Michigan sports <laughs> fan. You know, I grew up a Michigan fan. Uh, I have J.J. McCarthy up here signed a statue from the national championship. Big Michigan fan. It's broke my heart for a lot of years, a lot of years, but this year was a great year. And, you know, we have to be able to, uh, you know, with, with Tom, Tom, I say Tom like he's my friend, but I've never Your met buddy. a guy. <laughs> yeah, gonna gonna ask. Maybe he's yeah. listening. Maybe he's listening. Pro I don't know. I think he is a listener. I think yeah, he, is. he yeah. probably, probably. I mean, yeah, yeah this probably given. is given. Uh, it makes sense, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he has so many great leadership, uh, just off the cuff mm. discussions and talks. You know, now, you know, greatest of all time. So everybody wants to get inside the mind of Tom Brady. So, you know, all the companies are bringing him in. They're filming him. They're having him, you know, give talks to their, their, their companies that he's having him give uh, motivational speeches and stuff. But man, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. He, he I'm not talking about the roast that he just had, you know, cause that's probably <laughs> a little bit more, more PG 13 than the motivational stuff. But you know, he talks about, you know, being for, or what, what does he say? There, there's one thing it says like winning isn't being first. It's just being better today than you were yesterday. So you just have to have that perspective of what does it mean to be a winner? What does it mean to be a leader? And the top people in our sports world, how, why were they so successful? How were they successful? How were they able to have long-standing careers? Sure, it's a little bit of luck, but it's the mindset. It's it's the mindset they have, the the competitive drive. You know, there will be times in your life where things are difficult, you know, whether it's your personal life, your professional life. But you have to understand that's that's going to be temporary. That's temporary. That's a test for you for the future and what's to come for the future. And you know, I highly recommend checking out Tom Brady's motivational videos and, and speeches because you know, he dives deep into his mindset of what made him successful for 20 plus years and put him on the top for 20 plus years and kept him there that it's uh, it's truly remarkable. Yeah, you know, and uh, there's a very interesting documentary on Apple TV on the the dynasty of the New England Patriots. And it's actually really interesting seeing even from day one, him coming in the locker room and and, you know, at least trying to lead. Um, and, you know, seeing what the veterans were like, who is this kid? He hasn't done anything yet, but even the first game he came in and took over for Drew Bledsoe, he was, he was in that locker room, you know, inspiring, encouraging, trying to get them behind him. And, 
and uh, it was it's a really it's a really interesting watch. So I definitely uh, recommend that. I'm only a few episodes in. It definitely is R rated. I think it's TV mature is what they say now. So so yeah, that, that, love love that and appreciate all this conversation, Lance. Appreciate the the vulnerability. Appreciate just going in, giving the secrets, so we can watch the old games and seeing you wipe your forehead and. And know that uh, you blew another call, you know, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> no, of course, of course. Uh, There's always yeah, one, yeah, I mean, pre- as long as it's, as long as it's, you know, like I tell people, we were always told, it's like, you can make two mistakes in the game. You can make one for one team, you can make one for the other team. But when you start making multiple stakes for a team, then you got problems. That's right. That's right. That's right. So anyway, appreciate you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And all the Absolutely. best. Yep. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much for uh, for being a part of the conversation. Thank you for for joining us here. Uh, we'll have all the links for everything we talked about in the show notes. Uh, not necessarily every motivational talk of Tom Brady, but we'll have a couple in there for you to go check out. And not the roast because it was uh, not intended for children. But as always, we we hope that you're taking what you're learning from the show and you're using it in in every aspect of your life. That that you're using it, you're applying it, you're you're putting it into practice. And you know some of the things you could do. After this one is, is go get certified to be a referee. Go and, and learn. If you, know, if you have kids, get them, get them involved um, because it is there's so many lessons you can learn, but also just learn the game better too. If you want to learn more about Warrior Way or coaching a bigger game, you can find the links for those in the show notes. And uh, as we wrap it up, we wrap it up by uh, reminding you that we hope that you're taking what you're learning from this. You're using it to be a better spouse, a better parent, a better referee, a better coach better player, better in everything that you do. Continue to remind yourself that soccer does explain life and leadership. Thanks a lot. Have a great couple weeks. <laughs>